I looked around the room and saw nothing. It was too dark. Although I couldn't see anything, I could still feel it, and the sensations that slowly washed over me were wonderful. Almost wonderful enough to make me forget about the headache that was tearing me apart. As I turned my head to the left, I caught the faint but musky scent of an aroused woman. I thought my head would fly off its axis, but I forced myself to feel it. Then I realized that I had done something terrible, because the soft ass I was touching was too small to be Mabel's ass. Who? I began. But this syllable was enough to cause an explosion in my heat again. Just relax, baby, she said. I immediately recognized this voice. That sexy voice, full of cigarettes and gravel, could only belong to one woman in town, and the situation only got worse for me. I tried as hard as I could, but I really couldn't remember anything from the last 24 hours or any reason why my wife's sister would end up in bed with me giving me pleasure. Janet, as nice as this is, can you stop? I said. Suddenly light pierced the darkness. It was like another explosion in my overly sensitive skull. Oops, I probably shouldn't have done that, she said quietly. But I think you're wondering what's going on here, aren't you? Um, yes, I said. That's one of the questions running through my head. So you don't remember anything that happened last night? She asked. Not a bit, I said. But the way my head feels, I'm sure alcohol played a big role. You deserved and needed to lose your temper for a while, honey, she said. Actually, now I'm going to make sure we go crazy every now and then. What do you mean, we? I asked. Mabel is already going to kill me. Mabel's gone, darling, don't you remember that too? She asked. Did someone give me tequila? I asked. When I drink tequila, I lose a lot of my short-term memory. I also do really stupid things. Please tell me I didn't have more than one or two shots. She shook her head vigorously. Just watching her beautiful face move from side to side was enough to make my stomach spin. I quickly jumped out of bed and headed to the bathroom, I crashed straight into the wall where the bathroom should have been. I looked at Janet and she pointed to the door. I ran through the doorway behind her. I turned left and saw the toilet. The seat was soft and pink. I barely had time to pick it up before the contents of my digestive tract erupted out of me and into the bowl. Feeling better? She asked. She helped me up and gave me a bottle of mouthwash and a brand new toothbrush. I noticed that the toothbrush was blue, my favorite color. Another thing that surprised me was that Janet never took her eyes off me and actually wrapped her arms around me from behind while I was brushing my teeth. Janet's breasts weren't huge, but they were much larger and firmer than Mabel's. The thought that we were both naked suddenly seemed important to me. When I finished brushing my teeth and rinsing my mouth, she turned me towards her and looked at me. Let me check, she said. This offended me a little. Her sister, my wife, often told me the same thing early in our marriage. I think their mother must have done the same thing when they were young. Mabel expected me to smile and show her my teeth, so I tried to flash them to Janet. Not like that, honey, she said. She came up to me and kissed me. She pressed her naked body against mine and ran her tongue over my mouth. The reaction was immediate. Despite the hangover, I was completely aroused and tense. So even after last night, you still want more, huh? She asked. Janet, what I really want are answers, I said. Okay, honey, you get dressed. We still have to go to the bank when it opens in about an hour, but we can have coffee and eat until I explain everything to you. My name is Mabel Forrester. I walked along the road all night. The dogs chased me several times. My legs were cut and bleeding. Yesterday I wore very expensive high heels, and the tattered remains of them were discarded hours ago. These shoes were great for a night out, but useless for walking on country roads. Thank God it was finally light. I was still four or five miles from town and even further from home. If I even still had a home. If my damn sister decided, I probably didn't have it. I couldn't believe this little bitch. After everything I've done for her. She still stuck the knife in my back. It was true that she was always jealous of me, but I couldn't believe that she would stab me in the back like that. 
Whoever said blood is thicker than water has clearly never met Janet. Finally, lights appeared on the road behind me. The truck with the two teenagers inside slowed down as they approached me. I turned and saw that it was the Miller boy with Sarah Winslow sitting next to him. There were a couple of other children in the back of the truck. They were probably going to the lake for summer fun. I waved as they approached, but for some reason, as soon as they recognized me, they sped up and drove past. My legs hurt, my feet hurt, and I was hungry. I kept walking because I knew that if I stopped, I wouldn't be able to get up and walk again for a long time. I thought about the reaction on the children's faces when they recognized me. I knew it would be bad. Small towns are known for their unforgiving nature in certain situations, but their response was much worse than I expected. Have I really stepped so far that I am beyond Christian forgiveness and mercy? Just 24 hours ago, I woke up in my big wheelchair bed. I was the undisputed queen of these two interconnected small rural Iowa towns that made up our community. I was a queen not because of anything I did, although I would probably never admit it, but because of my husband. The funny thing about it was that he wasn't from here at all. He didn't grow up in Harrison or Delaval. He was only here for me. I met David Forrester while visiting my parents, who now lived in Chicago. They moved closer to advanced medical facilities. My mother had a condition that caused chronic pain, and there was a clinic in Chicago that specialized in several conditions, all of which were derivatives of the same condition. Anyway, Dave followed me home to spend more time with me and never left. We got married and decided to stay here. It was 23 years ago. The two towns of Harrison and Delaville each had their own mayors, sheriffs, and all other government offices. Each of them had their own schools. Two cities were founded by brothers who could not get along. In the early days, cities competed. But nowadays, due to the economy, they depended on each other. My good guy from Chicago, Mark, came into my life. Since both cities were tiny rural towns, there were many things they both needed. That first weekend when Dave arrived, one of my friends was desperate because he couldn't get his tractor fixed. He ran all over town trying to find someone who would let him borrow or rent his. Dave had a degree in mechanical engineering and suggested we look at the tractor. A part for the tractor had to be ordered, but he was able to go to a local shop and make a part that would work until the original part left the factory. As soon as this became known, Dave was accepted into both cities. Typically, farmers had to call the nearest major city to get a factory representative. They had to pay for travel and a large markup for both spare parts and labor, etc. Before he knew it, Dave had his own thriving business that both cities needed. At first, he only repaired tractors and farm equipment, then he expanded into appliances, and then electronics. Now he even services computers. My damn sister decided to go to school to become a computer technician and I begged Dave to hire her to fix computers for him. If I had known what the little girl was up to, I would have made sure she went to some bigger city as soon as she graduated. Janet was my parents' miracle. They always thought that I would be their only child. Then, when I was 15, my 45-year-old mother discovered she was pregnant. When I met Dave, I was 21 and Janet was 6. Now I am 44 years old and Janet is 29. Janet always loved Dave. She practically grew up next to him. For years, I knew she had what I thought was a high school crush on him, but I guess I never saw it for what it really was. In recent years, my love for Dave has become complacent. It wasn't that I didn't love him anymore, he just didn't excite me anymore. Over the years, Dave became as comfortable as an old pair of shoes. Hair, he was shaggy, like the local farm boys, and he also had a small belly. We were doing well financially, but you couldn't tell from the way Dave lived. Sure, I drove a Mercedes E-Class, but Dave had a rusting 7-year-old 2005 Mustang. The body panels were not rusty, but the springs, shock absorbers, and most of the car's mechanical components were rusty. I think this car was a lot like my husband. Proud, powerful, and in need of an upgrade. I think I've become more important over time. As Dave and his business became bigger and more important, so did I. Soon I began to wear only designer clothes and drove my Mercedes everywhere. Somehow, over time, Mark and I seemed to switch personalities. I became a big city woman, 
and Dave, originally from Chicago, became a small town boy. The community got tired of my big city antics and just fell in love with Dave when it all came to a head anyway. Dave was just like them. He provided loans to farmers who could not get them anywhere else. He also deferred payments for equipment repairs until after harvest because he knew that was when they could most afford to pay them. Another thing he did that really upset me was schools. The Unified School District decided to purchase several computers for laboratories at each school. The total number of computers in the entire district was only about 50 machines, but still quite a large number. The county had to get quotes from three companies to maintain and upgrade the machines. Two companies, of course, were out-of-town sellers. They both came up with annual figures that were far more than the cities could afford. It was decided to hold a town meeting to discuss the tax and raise money for computer maintenance. I was as shocked as everyone else when Dave stood up at the meeting and told the meeting, which included the mayors and city councils of both cities, that he would do it for free. He also did upgrades for just the cost of the software. I couldn't believe he threw away that amount of money. But it was Dave. He believed that we had enough money to live very comfortably, and that was enough. Of course, this only made me even more important in the city and ultimately led me to where I am today. I don't remember exactly when I first thought I was tired of Dave or missed him, but it actually happened. I started dressing even better and spending more and more time away from home. I also started flirting more openly. At first, the guys in town flirted with me, but after a while they stopped. They just looked at me strangely. I told myself that it was because they were from a small town and therefore close-minded. But during the walk, after yesterday's embarrassment, I realized that I was wrong. And of course there's Jeff, Jeffrey Rossberg, attorney. He flew into the city like a breath of fresh air. He also has an E-class. I just found out last night that the car is not actually his. It belonged to his wife, whom he wisely forgot to tell me about. In fact, most of what Jeffrey told me in the four months we had sex was not true. Either way, Jeff responded to my flirting and took it to the next level. He always complimented me and told me how beautiful I was. The funny thing about this was that, essentially, Jeff was supposed to date Janet. After all, he went out with her on a couple of dates when he first arrived in town, and then she didn't want to deal with him anymore. She just laughed every time his name was mentioned. I think in this case, my little sister was smarter than me. It's a pity that no one told me why she left him. Maybe then I wouldn't be walking along this lonely rural road now. Looks like it was like Dave again. Ever since she met him, my sister always compared every guy she met to my husband. And, I think in her eyes, most of them were not up to his level. I needed to get into town to find someone to take me home. As a last resort, I needed to withdraw money from one of our accounts so I could return home. David Forrester, are you dressed yet? Despite how bad I felt, hearing Janet yell at me felt right. Come here if you want coffee. Janet, please stop screaming, I said as I walked into her immaculate kitchen. Janet stood in front of the coffee maker, as naked as the day she was born. She turned around and kissed me again. She pressed her naked body against mine and put everything she had into the kiss. Shouldn't you be wearing something? I asked. No, I want you to remember me like this, she smiled. Then she kissed me again. Why do you keep doing this? I asked her. Because I don't know how this is going to end, she said. And just in case things don't work out the way they should, I'll know that I put everything I could into it. She just smiled at me. What's the last thing you remember before you woke up this morning? She asked. Think carefully. We sat down at her kitchen table and she grabbed my hand. I got a call early last night asking me to come out and look at the big Gaussian projectors they use at the drive-in theater, I said. They were having trouble getting the video feed from those little wireless cameras they used to appear on the screen. It turned out it wasn't a hardware problem, but a software problem, so I started working on it. I didn't have much time, since they wanted to use wireless cameras between films in a double showing, I said. Now everything was coming back. She saw that I was beginning to remember something and squeezed my hand. I needed to test the system, so I sent a couple of their guys to film some stuff. You know, funny stuff, like couples kissing in cars. They showed that shit on the big screen between movies. It was always funny. 
I was only going to show it. There were projections on the monitors in the booth, but somehow I mixed up the channels and broadcast the footage on the big screen, so everyone in the audience saw your sister, my wife, letting that snake in the grass knead her breasts. I couldn't continue. I almost started crying like a baby. Janet began to stroke my hand. Do you remember anything after that? She asked. I ran to his car, I said. I pulled him out of the car and punched him in the mouth. I only punched him once, but he folded up like a concertina. After that, a lot of people came. You were there, Janet. I was shocked. Mrs. Daniels, an old lady who volunteers at the library on Tuesdays, came up and asked me if I hit him in the groin. I shook my head so she did it, and she hit him hard. Janet winced and then smiled, remembering it. What happened after that? She asked. I remember the sheriff came over and tried to wake Jeff up. Jeff came to his senses and told the sheriff he wanted to file a battery report on me because I hit him and probably hit him in the groin. Five or six people came up and they all said Jeff was staggering and fell and hit his mouth on the side of his car. They thought he was drunk. So the sheriff took them at their word and gave Jeff a ticket for public drunkenness and another for driving a motor vehicle. DUI. He then gave him a ticket for filing a false crime report for his accusation against me. I remember him screaming that he was being framed, and the sheriff took them both, Jeff and Mabel, but they didn't go towards the prison. They went to the cinema. You and I were there, too. The judge was there, Janet, like he could know. I'll tell you later, honey. Continue, she smiled. The judge just looked at Mabel and shook his head. He was talking to her, and I wasn't paying attention to what he was telling her, but he pulled out some papers and made her sign them. She kept saying she didn't want to sign them. That it was all a mistake. He said yes, and that she made a mistake, but the city protects its own. Janet nodded her head. Then they took them outside, and I don't remember what happened to them, but I remember sitting with the judge, the sheriff, the mayor, and a bunch of other guys. We were drinking and having fun. There were a few women there, too. I remember the smell of it frying. Meat. Was it barbecue? Janet nodded again. Then I remember waking up this morning with you, uh... Okay, let me fill in some blanks for you, she said. This all started about a week ago. But actually, I think the seeds were sown much earlier. I could tell she was about to tell me something painful, because she took my cup of coffee and led us into the living room, where we sat on her couch. I sat up straight on the sofa. I was afraid that any position where I had to lean or lean back would cause my still aching head to fall off my neck. Janet, on the other hand, sat next to me as close as possible. She threw her legs over my lap and still held my hands. Comfortable, she asked. I nodded and she looked at her watch. It was almost nine. There was no chance of reaching the city in twelve minutes. I didn't care because I didn't know why we would go to the bank at all. Okay. I'm sure you know that ever since I knew what boys were, I've had a crush on you. What you don't know is that it wasn't a high school crush. Over the years, Mabel and I have had a lot of, we had a fight over you once. The last one was just a week ago. We'll get to that later. Anyway, I've had boyfriends here and there because I'm human, but none of them were right for you. She smiled at me and kissed my hand. About six weeks ago, I started dating Jeff Rosberg. We went out a couple of times, and as usual, he just wasn't you. I haven't gotten rid of guys just because they weren't you, but I thought he was pretty creepy. I felt like he was just another skirt hunter and I wasn't going to be another one of his prey. Then when I checked him out on the internet, it got even more interesting. He's probably one of the biggest liars in the world. The car he's driving drives, not his. It's his wife's car. The firm he works for is not his. He's not a lawyer, he's a paralegal. He just files court papers for the lawyers at the firm the firm belongs to his wife's father, and his last name isn't actually Rossberg. That's his wife's family's last name, and they just let him take it when he married her. So I left him. She smiled at me again. I began to enjoy her company. So after we broke up, I started hearing from people that we slept together, which wasn't true. I didn't care as long as he didn't say it in front of me. But then people started asking me really weird questions, like, have you ever slept with your sister? 
It turned out he was going around town telling people that he slept with Mabel, too. And I thought it was the same as with me. Complete nonsense. Then last week I saw them behind a restaurant on 4th Street. He had his hand under her skirt and she just stood there letting him do it. So I walked up to them and hit him, asking, How could she be so stupid? Janet got really emotional, so I gave her a little hug for what she did. This caused her to groan a little. Anyway... She just looked at me really blankly, with her eyes wide, she said. Then she told me that I don't understand. That you're always at work and she's bored. She needed to have a little fun some teams, and I'll understand that when I grow up. Jeff started to get angry when she called him fun. So she said that she didn't mean that he was fun. She then said that he had more in common with her than you ever had. She was tired of you, constantly giving away business. She was talking about how you could earn much more money and live in a much bigger house. You both could be much richer. Janet stood up and went to the phone. She pointed her finger at me as if to say, Wait, we'll finish this in a minute. She dialed the number and then waited. She then started talking to someone on the line. I heard her mention my name a couple of times and told them I was fine. Then she held the phone to my ear. Hello, I said. Hi, Dave, I'm sorry for your loss, but in the end you'll be in a much better place and you'll probably be happier too. I just spoke with Janet, and I just need you to confirm the temporary changes in your personal accounts. Okay, I said. So are you really allowing all your personal accounts and all access to these accounts to be temporarily blocked? She asked. Um, yeah, I said. But what about my business accounts? I still want my people to be able to order supplies and buy things. None of your business accounts will be affected, she said. Okay, thanks, I said, and then handed the phone back to Janet. Janet talked to the woman for a few more minutes. I heard her laugh a couple of times and asked the woman to call her if this happened. Then she turned to me. She took my hand and led me back to her couch. Lie down, Dave, she said. I lay down and she took off my shoes. Then she lay down next to me on her big, soft old sofa. She moved closer to my butt until we spooned and began her story again. She begged me not to tell you that I saw them together, Janet said. But then, as usual, Jeff started chatting. He told her it didn't matter because you were going to find out about them sooner or later anyway when she filed for divorce. Then I saw Red. My stupid sister thought that Jeff is a rich lawyer, but like I told you, he doesn't have a pot of his own. He just saw this as a chance to hook up with an even dumber woman and force you to provide for them both after the divorce. I was shocked by what I just heard from Janet. But I loved her, I said. Janet snuggled closer to me. I know you loved her, honey, but you can and must forget her. I'm convinced of that, she said. Anyway, I went to the judge and told him everything I knew. We drew up the divorce papers at that time. The problem was that we needed a reason to get her to sign them. All the divorce laws in this country are written like that, to protect a woman's interests in the event of a divorce, even when she is a lying, cheating, heartbreaking bastard like my sister. So we thought about it and decided that the best way would be to offer what we thought was a fair settlement, either a lump sum or monthly payments, and get her to sign it. We needed some leverage to get her to sign them. Believe it or not, the incident at the drive-in movie theater was an accident. We didn't plan it. But there were several people in town who knew what was going on between Mabel and Jeff and were there to take photographs and gather evidence for us. Our plan was to call Mabel one day and confront her with all the evidence of her cheating on you and force her to sign the papers. Then we would make her write you a goodbye letter and leave town. And after she left, I would help you forget about her. Either way, after seeing her on a giant screen in front of half of both cities pleasuring someone else's boyfriend, we have an even stronger case. The judge and sheriff took Jeff to jail last night. His wife and her family posted bail for him in the morning and dragged him home. According to Bonnie from the bank, he will soon be divorced and stripped of everything. They released Mabel outside the drive-in theater, but since Jeff's car was impounded, she had to try to walk home. But it's almost 30 miles? I said. Let him get what he deserves, Janet chuckled. Anyway, honey, you were in shock. 
Seeing the woman you love 20 feet above the ground on that giant screen in front of the entire city would probably do it. The judge decided the best thing for you was to take you out of yourself and get drunk. That's what they did. The sheriff remembered how his brother came out of his divorce hangover by being with another woman in some cheap bar. I couldn't let that happen, so as soon as you got drunk, I took the initiative into my own hands. I looked at Janet then. I wondered why she did all this. I don't usually drink much, I said. In college, I realized I had a low tolerance for alcohol. If I drink tequila, it's really bad. Darling, she said, you must have been in bad shape back then, because not only did you finish the whole bottle, you ate a damn worm. I didn't know what to say to this, so I just tried to look somewhere to the side. Then I brought you home, she said. I brought you to my house, because I feel comfortable here and it was closer. Do you remember the rest? She looked at me, raising one eyebrow and smiling widely. No, I said. Did I act like a fool when I was drunk? You know? You mean, have you tried to have sex with me? She asked mockingly. I nodded, nervous. She snuggled even closer to me. No, you didn't try, she began, and I felt relieved. I stripped you naked as soon as we walked in the door, and we had sex three times last night. The first time was right on the floor there. She pointed to a spot right by the door. For the second one, we went to my bedroom. It was really nice. You told me you loved me then, and you said that if you weren't already married, you would have married me. Then we fell asleep. I woke up around three in the morning and went to the bathroom. I felt really good. When I went back to bed and snuggled up to you, it started again. I was beyond shame. I'm sorry, Janet. I told her. It must have been at least as bad for you as it was for me. I really don't know what to say or do. I just feel numb right now. I can't believe Mabel could cheat on me. I think I have no idea. And to be honest, it's not my fault. I kind of let myself go. I guess I'm just like that rusty old Mustang out there. You can look at me and say that I once was someone, but now I'm just a joke. I tried to sit up and move away from her, but she just pressed herself closer to me. Janet, I'm sane now, I told her. I just wish you didn't have to be the sacrificial sheep that put up with me last night. Dave, are you out of your mind? She barked, standing up and looking at me. Oh, sometimes you make me so mad, she said. Why the hell do you think I'm here? She asked. Do you know why you woke up here and not in some cheap brothel? She asked. I shook my head dumbly. You're all confused about everything and you feel like an object of pity. You just don't see things because one stupid woman who doesn't see things right herself tried to throw mud at you. Janet was clearly angry. David, do I feel like I can't handle one drunk man? She exclaimed. Besides, you're not a violent drunk and you're not aggressive at all. Everything that happened to you last night was because people care about you. The sheriff and the judge love you. All the people in these two small towns love you. We couldn't do it without you. Your business serves both cities, and most of the time you charge much less than anyone else. You give credit to small farmers and small business owners. You do things for schools, etc. Dave, we all love you, she said. We won't let anyone pee on you, including my stupid sister. And about last night, you apparently forgot that I took your clothes off, Dave. I wanted to be with you. I always wanted this, so when the opportunity presented itself, I took advantage of her, she said. Both you and your Mustang just need a little attention. Just a little polishing and sprucing up to help you reach your full potential. And then you'll both be something worth celebrating. She was silent for a while, just looking at me. You have 60 days before you have to appear in court to sign the final divorce papers or try to win back my stupid sister. Why don't you go on a diet, start a workout program, and restore your car? so you can shine. It's enough to make Mabel pull her damn head out of her ass and want you back, or maybe you'll get over her and want someone else. I don't know how far from town I was when the next truck arrived. It was a large, old truck, probably delivering some parts or materials. The driver looked at me from the cab of the truck and asked where I was going. I just need to get to town, I told him. How old are you? He asked. I think my vanity made me think he was wondering if I was under 18. In fact, the reality was completely different. I'm 35, I told him, 
subtracting about ten years from my actual age. Your dress is older than you, he said sharply, but it's a good starting point. Remember that old saying from the 80s about giving rides to hitchhikers? No, I said, puzzled. It was on all the bumper stickers, he said. I still don't remember, I said. Gasoline, grass, or... He hinted. Ah, I said, remembering. I don't have money to give you for gas because I'm going to the bank in town. I've never smoked marijuana, so I don't have that either, and I don't see how we can... I began. I was sure that the driver would not leave me in trouble, many miles from the city. He stuck his head back into the cabin and started the engine, starting to drive away. Wait, I screamed. No matter what I had to do, I couldn't take another step. He helped me climb into the bed of his truck. He then took off my dress and started having sex with me. I was surprised and numb. It wasn't lovemaking, it was... I didn't even know what to call it. Dave was always gentle with me and slowly worked me up until I was just begging him to please me. I haven't actually had sex with Jeff yet. We were on our way to this last night when we got caught, but I wasn't going to have sex with Jeff until he asked me to marry him. Either way, the truck was just being rude to me. I wanted to scream at him to stop, but if I did, he would throw me out of the truck and I would have to walk the rest of the way into town. Any challenge was better than this. So I just let him use my body while my mind tried to figure out the next step. As soon as I get into town, I'll withdraw money from the bank and call Dave and Jeff. I couldn't afford to wait 60 days to talk to my husband. The money they gave me was completely insufficient to live on. Plus, I wasn't even sure I wanted a divorce. And Jeff, I liked that he was in better shape than Dave and that he wore flashy clothes and drove a car like mine. But I wasn't sure I wanted him. He really was exactly what I told my stupid little sister. He was entertainment. Sure, Dave was boring, but when things go wrong, Dave is the type of man who will be there for me. I didn't know about Jeff. There was also the fact that even though he was out of shape, Dave was trying to protect me. I couldn't believe it when I saw him pull Jeff, who was bigger, out of the car and beat him up because of me. So I needed to get to the bank and withdraw some money so I could rent a car or pay someone to drive me home. I'll talk to Dave there and find out what our situation is. If we can get this sorted out, the judge's order and the preliminary divorce agreement I signed last night won't mean anything. After the truck stopped me, he even dared to reach out to kiss me. Maybe you'll let me in again later, he asked. Just drive the truck, I replied sharply. He was right about letting him again. I didn't get anything out of it. I couldn't believe it when we arrived at the bank. We only drove for about 10 minutes. He had me for about an hour and a half for a 10-minute ride. I got off the truck and showed him the fact as I sat down on the bench in front of the bank. I was so tired that I fell asleep almost instantly. Even my select comfort bed at home didn't feel as comfortable as the bare wood bench. I woke up a couple of times before the bank opened. The first time was when I heard a rooster at dawn. I knew that there were still a few hours before the bank opened at nine in the morning. I walked up to the diner and asked the waitress if I could have breakfast if I promised to come back and pay for it later when the bank opened. She looked at me as if I were an insect crawling out from under a stone. Hell no, she snorted. Without money, there is no food. I knew she wasn't the owner of the restaurant, so I asked her who the boss was. She pointed to the guy behind the counter. I walked up to him and slammed my hand on the plate in front of him. Do you know who I am? I asked him. Just a woman who slept in her dress, he said. Do you know my name? I shouted at him. Everyone in the diner looked at us. Mabel, not only do I know your name, I know the size of your saggy breasts and how you like to be touched and pinched. I know a lot of things about you that I don't understand. What the hell do you want? He spoke quietly, so it did not arouse interest among his clients. The tone of his voice made it clear to me that not only did he know about last night, but he also had no intention of cutting me any slack. I turned and walked away, maintaining my dignity. On my way past the back of the restaurant, I saw a guy knock on the door. The door opened, and the cook gave him a bag of food. I approached him and asked if I could have some of this food. Show me your breasts, he muttered. I looked around and made sure that no one could see us. Then I leaned forward and pulled down the front of my dress. He reached out and roughly grabbed my left breast. They're kind of flat and saggy, 
he said. He turned my back to him and grabbed my butt. Hey, where's my food? I asked. I am starving. What food? He asked, clutching his bag tighter. You said if I showed you my breasts, you'd give me some of your food, I reminded him. No, he said. That's what you heard. You came up and asked if you could have some of my food. I didn't say you could or that I would share with you. I just asked you to show me your breasts. There was no food deal. Plus, all you have to do is walk up to the door and knock. This food is all the leftovers they can't sell. That's what I love about this town. They give it away because they can't sell it. You let everyone who asks to see your breasts and touch your butt? I left him and went to knock on the door. The young man who opened it almost died from shock. He quickly closed the door in my face. I returned to the bank and sat down on my bench again. A few minutes later, I fell asleep again. An hour or so later, I woke up when I thought several large drops of rain fell on me. I thought I was going to get wet, but luckily it stopped. The next time I woke up, it was bright and sunny outside and the bank was about to open. I wondered why none of the bank employees woke me up when they came inside. Dave did a lot of business with this bank. They couldn't afford to break their relationship with me. Several children pointed at me and laughed. I looked angrily at their mother, who took them away, and she also smiled. I knew that my dress was wrinkled, but that was no reason to be rude. Sally Anderson, who worked at the bank, saw me when I walked in and smiled, looking away. I realized that she was also going to start laughing at me. I stood in line with the cashiers. The man at the end of the line looked at me as if he was terrified. He started coughing and quickly went and sat down at the table the bank provided for filling out forms or writing checks. The woman in line in front of me now motioned for me to move forward. She tried not to laugh as she dialed a number on her cell phone. She stayed about five feet away from me in line. Mary Dickinson came over and took me out of the line, leading me to her office. Mary and I went to school together and she used to handle all our bills. Hi, Mary, I said. I'm glad you came for me. I don't have a wallet and I need money. Oh, it doesn't matter, she smiled. Finally, I said. I thought that I had finally found someone in this small town who respected me the way I deserved. I noticed Mary dialing a number on the phone and trying her best not to laugh. What's so funny about my wrinkled dress? I asked. It's not the dress, Mary said, laughing. She took out a mirror from one of her tables. She handed me a mirror and I looked at myself. My makeup was terrible. My eyeliner ran down my face, giving me the appearance of a raccoon. My expensive lip gloss was smeared vulgarly all over my face, probably when the truck driver kissed me while he made love to me. I looked like a cross between Heath Ledger in his latest Batman movie and a transvestite, approachable woman. But what probably made everyone laugh the most was two large drops of bird poop right in the front of my hair. What I took for raindrops was a message from the pigeons that they didn't approve of me either. So, you said it doesn't matter that I don't have my wallet or ID, I said with as much dignity as I could muster. I think $200 will be enough, I said. When I said it didn't matter, Mary began. What I meant was that it doesn't matter whether you have a wallet or not, because I can't give you money. What the hell do you mean, you country bitch, I exclaimed. I jumped to my feet and leaned towards her, breathing heavily. If only she knew what I had to go through. Mary remained calm and professional. Mabel, even though you think you belong to the high society of the big city, and have fancy clothes and a car, you are just as country as I am. We went to school together, played together, and grew up together in the same small town. So get off your high horse and let me explain what's going on. I sat back down, and she waited a few moments and then started talking again. The accounts you have access to have been temporarily frozen, she said. I don't understand, I snapped. This has never happened before. Why is my money frozen? Do you know how much money I have in this damn bank? Yes, I know, she said sweetly. Not one damn cent. All the money in each of these accounts, including the credit cards you don't have on you right now, belongs to your husband. 
or if the information from last night is correct, soon to be ex-husband. I don't understand what's going on here, I snapped, but Dave and I are still married, and we will be until the final verdict is signed. I'll get myself a great lawyer, and in 60 days no papers will be signed. Dave and I will be together again, and all you rednecks will have a lot of time to eat a crow covered in shit. Mary started laughing. What's so funny? I barked. You should have taken out the last R. Then we would have eaten you, she laughed. Okay, she said. I was told if you come, I am authorized to offer you zero dollars and give you a phone number. Here is zero dollars, she gave me an empty bank envelope. And then she handed me the phone. Dave, I'm so sorry, I said into the phone. No, you don't regret it. Mabel, you chose your path. Now follow it. Dave can't answer the phone right now. I recognized that voice. It was my sister, Janet. Janet, you are not taking my husband, I screamed into the phone. Why not, Mabel? She asked. He will make some woman in this city a happy wife. Why not me? Because you are my sister, I told her. That must mean something. That means I called mom and dad in Chicago. I didn't tell them what a mean thing you did to the man who loved you and supported you for over 20 years the same man who pays for all of mom's expensive procedures. I decided that I'll let you tell them. Janet, what are you talking about? I asked. Dave needs some time away from you to clear his head, she said. So you will go to Chicago for two months. You can return in 60 days for a court hearing. You will also have one meeting with Dave during that time. Until then, Mabel, leave him alone. He is suffering enough as it is. I... I left you a bus ticket at the station and a suitcase with some of your fashionable things. I even left you $20 to buy food during the trip. Stay with mom and dad for a couple of months and think about your actions. Perhaps when you return, he will be ready to talk to you. Or maybe you can contact Jeff in the meantime. Thank you, Janet, I said. I really wish I could talk to Dave and resolve this, but at least you gave me a chance. Don't thank me, she said coldly. I will try my best to take it from you. That night, Janet made me a salad for dinner, lettuce, tomatoes, and celery from her garden, with some turkey chunks for protein. Great snack, I said. What else will we have? It was dinner, she said. You are on a diet. After dinner, she washed all the dishes and dragged me into the kitchen to rinse and dry them, even though I repaired every appliance in town and had contracts with every major manufacturer, Jeanette didn't have a dishwasher. I don't want her, she said when I mentioned it. Afterwards, we sat on the porch and watched the stars and the night from her porch swing. When it got cooler, she wrapped a blanket around us and we sat rocking and talking. She made me talk about everything I felt. It felt really good to talk it out. She also told me many things that I never knew about her. I watched her grow up, but apparently there are things about the people we know and love that are secrets to all of us. Janet managed my computer repair department, but she didn't have her own computer at home. She had an iPad that she could use for email and internet services, but at home she preferred simplicity. She was basically a country girl educated in the city. Mabel, on the other hand, wanted all the modern conveniences. She only kept things until a new model came out. The more complex a thing was, the more she valued it. Mabel hasn't worked a day. She considered herself to belong to the fast pace of the modern city and thought life here was boring. Perhaps staying in Chicago was the best decision for her. When it was time for bed, I grabbed the blanket we were using on the porch and headed to the couch. What are you going to do? asked Janet. I'm going to bed, I said. Our bedroom is upstairs, she said sharply. Janet, I've already taken too much advantage of your hospitality, I began. God, what an idiot you are, she chuckled. Okay, last night we slept together. True, you were drunk, but I wasn't. You've already made love to me more than once. If you don't want to have sex with me, that's fine. But why should I suffer? What do you mean by suffering? I asked. Last night, for the first time, I got what my sister had for half her damn life. I fell asleep holding someone who cared about me. I was so happy that the first thing that came to my mind this morning was, well, you remember. Anyway, I know you didn't mean what you said last night, and I don't demand it from you. 
but I really would like you to sleep next to me at least for a few more nights. Me. There's no need for me to be here alone in my little house while you wander alone in that supermarket you and Mabel called home. She looked at me and smiled. I won't bite you unless you ask. I won't pressure you. Let's just be friends. I promise. I followed her upstairs, remembering what her body looked like without clothes. As I lay down that night, listening to her breathing as she pressed herself against me, I tried to compare it to sleeping next to her sister. I don't know where I came from because when I woke up the next morning, she pulled me out of bed. Come on, get up. It's time to get up, she said. What? I said. What's for breakfast? Dirt, she smiled. We're going for morning exercises. Breakfast will be only after we get rid of the belly. I got out of bed, and she had already prepared sweatpants and a t-shirt for me. I got dressed while she smiled at me. Don't forget your sneakers, she said mockingly. I bent down and put on my shoes. I noticed that she was wearing flip-flops. How are you going to run in those? I asked. I'm not going to, she chuckled. I'll train with you, but I don't need as much as you. My legs and ass already like you, so I'm good. We left the house. I complained all the way. It was barely light. We're running to the diner for breakfast. You get a glass of fresh juice, two strips of bacon, half a slice of lightly buttered toast, and half a grapefruit, she said. All? I muttered. That's not the worst part, she grinned. It's six in the morning. Your breakfast will be waiting for you until 6.20. The diner is two miles away. If it takes you more than 20 minutes to get there, you'll be left without food. What happens when I get there? I asked. Then you and I will have breakfast together. Then we will run back home, do our morning exercises, and then take a shower and go to work. You have a short day planned, after which we will return here to start doing that other thing. What other matter? I asked. We'll talk about this when the time comes. Hurry up or you'll be left without breakfast. She smiled. I started to run. The ten-minute miles were pretty easy, so she had a good plan. Every week we would cut the time a minute until I could follow it. This meant that every week I had to get 30 seconds faster per mile. This meant that by the end of the fourth week, I would have achieved the fastest speed I had ever run, eight minutes per mile. I didn't know what would happen next, but now I just wanted my breakfast, so I ran. Every time I fell behind or tried to relax, Janet pulled ahead. Just seeing her attractive ass in those shorts made me want to run faster. When we arrived at the diner, Rose, the waitress, smiled at us and pointed to our table. She looked at the clock on the wall, and we had 30 seconds left before we would be hungry. Janet told me how proud she was of me. She kicked off her flip-flops under the table and ran her bare feet up and down my sweaty feet. She seemed to enjoy touching me every chance she got. It was so different from Mabel and the way she only touched me when we had sex. I noticed how all the men in the diner were looking at Janet in her gym clothes. The strange thing about all of this was that when Mabel got dressed, she did it so that people would notice her, and she had to walk around and make sure that everyone saw her. She then had to point out to me that people were looking at her. Somehow, Janet made it clear to me that only my opinion was important to her. We returned home much more slowly. When we arrived and I was about to collapse, she looked at me and said, Oh no, cowboy, we're not done yet. Squats and push-ups, we need to get our upper body in shape too. Janet's concept of squats was strange. I lay down on the floor and bent my knees. She sat on top of my legs, holding my legs for leverage. Every time I got up, she kissed me. The first time I only did ten, then I fell. Come on, one more, she said affectionately. I'll make it worthwhile. I looked at her. I can't, Janet, I said. Come on, she said. You'll like it. I began to pull myself up, tensing my stomach all the way. I was about to give up until I looked at Janet and noticed that she had taken off her shirt. My eyes widened, and I stretched myself all the way, only to ask her why she did it. When I was almost at the top, she grabbed me and pulled me the rest of the way. I knew you could do it, she said. Then she kissed me, but this kiss was not just a click like all the others. She stuck her tongue in my mouth and pressed me to her chest. You can do whatever you want, Dave, she said. I really believe in you. 
I felt warmth throughout my body. Push-ups, she said. I need ten. Janet's push-ups also included kissing. I got into a push-up position over her, and every time I needed to lower my body down, our lips would touch. Then I needed to push upward from her. As out of shape as I was, I could only do six, but she was still proud of me. Wait until you can do twenty, she said. I was even more exhausted. But you didn't play sports, I said. I warmed up watching you, darling, she chuckled. Then I went up to her bathroom to take a shower. I was about to soap myself up when the shower door opened and Janet walked in. Relax, you don't have to do anything you don't want to, she said. I'm just saving time and water. After our shower, we headed to work. Over the past few years, I have always held morning meetings with all employees. This way, we knew what we needed to do in terms of personnel and checked whether any areas, such as farm equipment repair, household appliances or computers, needed more people, or if they were not busy and could help someone else. I usually did anything unusual, and I had a few clients who wanted me to handle their renovations personally. After the meeting, I thanked everyone for handling everything while I was gone the previous day. They were all very supportive and told me that I should take more time to rest. I was getting ready to choose my renovation and discovered that my renovation was already scheduled. My work was in the workshop downstairs. I went down there and before I could turn on the light, the door slammed loudly and I was pushed roughly against the wall. When I got off the bus in Chicago, I was furious. Janet had a damn good sense of humor. None of the clothes she put in the suitcase matched. In the bus station restroom, I opened my suitcase and tried to change into another outfit to replace my mint dress. I found a few pairs of casual pants that would be perfect for riding the bus. Unfortunately, she didn't include any tops that would go with them. The few tops she put in were great, but were meant to be worn with skirts or to be worn under other clothes. Another problem was that she hadn't packed any stockings, just socks, none of which matched the others. The same went for shoes. She gave me six shoes, four of which were unmatched, and the last two were ridiculously high stiletto heels and very unstable. They were perfect for a cocktail party or a theater premiere, but for any event where walking was required, they were terrible. So I ended up wearing loud yellow pants that were too tight and an orange and purple striped shirt. I wore them without stockings or socks and in shoes that, in this context, made me look like an approachable girl. My bus was leaving soon, so all I could do was quickly try to remove the bird poop from my hair. This meant I didn't have time to do my makeup and, believe it or not, Janet somehow forgot to send the makeup with me. So I looked like a circus clown turned approachable girl with smudged joker makeup and dried bird droppings in my hair as I boarded the bus. And guess what? It still didn't give me any privacy. As soon as the bus started moving, the old man stood up, walked three seats, and sat down next to me. How much does sex cost? He asked so loudly that I was sure everyone on the bus heard him. My life couldn't get any better. It was an eight-hour bus ride. The only window on the bus that didn't open was the one next to me. However, the bus seat was even more comfortable than my bench, so I quickly fell asleep. I woke up and found the old man next to me groping my breasts. I hit him so hard that he fell out of his seat and then started muttering to everyone that I was the only available woman he had ever dated who was anything but friendly. And that, I'm too expensive. He also confided in the man he sat next to that I wasn't worth it because my breasts were soft. The man really needed to learn to whisper because everyone on the damn bus could hear him. When we stopped at the first station, the driver made everyone get off the bus. I begged him to let me stay on the bus and sleep, but he refused. He said that we would only be at the station for 20 minutes, and I could sit on the bench in front of the station, and he would arrive right in 20 minutes and wake me up if I fell asleep. That's exactly what I did. After my recent adventure, I was as tired as ever and my legs hurt a lot. I got off the bus, dragging my suitcase behind me, and sat down on a bench right in front of the station. Of course, I fell asleep, and the bus driver woke me up a few minutes later. He smiled at me when he woke me up. Did someone shit in my hair again? I asked. No, he smiled, pointing down. 
Suddenly I noticed that someone's small dog was urinating on the leg of the bench on which I was sitting, and all this was pouring on me. I moved my leg and he pointed to the sign I had just sat next to. When I first sat down, I saw a sign that I thought was the name of the station we were at. In my condition, I didn't feel the need to read anything that didn't say Chicago in it. The sign read, Fresh Paint. I tried to stand up only to find that my clothes were stuck to the quickly drying bench. The driver picked me up, tearing my shirt in the process. I didn't care anymore. I just wanted to get to Chicago and start planning how I would get back to one of my men. The driver did not allow me to board the bus. He put a stack of newspapers on the seat to protect it from my clothes getting painted on them. Then we hit the road. When we arrived at the train station in Chicago, I stood up only to find newspapers stuck to the back of my clothes. I just got up and got off the bus. My mom and dad were waiting for me. I could tell by their faces that they were wondering what had happened to me. My father walked towards me and then quickly backed away. Mabel, you smell like cat piss, he said. Actually, Dad, it's dog urine, but that's a long story, I said. The people at the bus station smiled and laughed at my clothes and my face and, of course, at the newspapers stuck to my back. My mother didn't say a word. Moms always know. My dad was his normal self. He laughed and smiled, trying to keep the conversation going. We were all shocked when the old man I was riding with part of the way came over and said to my dad, Hey buddy, if I were you, I'd find another available girl. Her services are too expensive, her breasts are too soft, she's mean and she smells cat urine. I think she might have a disease. If you're so desperate for a woman, there are plenty of prostitutes here, let this one go. He walked away, leaving my dad standing with his mouth open. As soon as we got into the car, my dad asked me what the man was talking about. Just a misunderstanding, Dad, I smiled. Then my mother took the initiative into her own hands. Mabel, what have you done? She asked, looking at me as if she saw through me. Mom, how do you know I did something? I squealed. Mabel, if someone did something bad to you, you would be the first to tell Dave about it and he would deal with it. This man loves you. He would never let anyone hurt you for anything in the world. If Dave did something bad to you, you should have called your sister first and then us. Janet called us and told us to come pick you up at the station. When I asked her if Dave and her were okay, she said that she is fine, and Dave is in a lot of pain, but he'll be fine in the end. All of this suggests that you did something, so what did you do? She insisted. Even my father looked at me. Is it so bad that you can't fix it? He asked. I'm not sure I want to fix this, I said. Dave is boring, so I found someone else. My dad braked so hard that I almost flew through the windshield. What? He asked. He just looked at me like I was stupid. Over the next few days, I adjusted to life at my parents' house. They mentioned several times a day that they weren't too happy about me returning to the nest, even temporarily. Their house was a three-room colonial. There was their bedroom where they slept. There was a second bedroom that they turned into a gym or exercise room. And there was a final bedroom that they turned into a home theater and media room. I slept on the living room floor in a sleeping bag because they spent $1,100 on the couch, and Dad didn't want me to ruin it. On the third day, I finally contacted Jeff. He answered the phone call with caution. Hello, he said in a quiet voice. Jeff, honey, it's me, I squealed. The line went silent. Then someone else answered the phone. Who is this? They asked. This is Mabel Forrester, I said. Oh, bitch, she responded sharply. This is Jeffrey's wife, or perhaps his ex-wife. I haven't decided yet whether I should forgive him again. Did you know that Jeffrey is without a job, without a roof over his head, and without a car? I was shocked. What about the Mercedes E-Class? I asked. Jeffrey used my car while running errands for the court as my paralegal. He got into some trouble recently in Delaval, and my father fired him. If you want to support Jeffrey, he's given to you. I'll collect all his few belongings in package, and you can come and pick it up. I hung up, realizing that I had problems. I've been lying to myself these past few weeks. 
I was caught in a fantasy where I was the star of my own little world, and everyone else was just a supporting or bit player. I have now reached the scene where the heroine is put to the test. The question is, can I pass this test? Three paths were laid out before me. The first and most reliable was to start an independent life. I am a strong woman and could go out and get a job to be self-sufficient. Or I could invent something or start my own business. The second choice was to get out and find another man who would take care of me and meet my needs. After all, I was a beautiful and well-dressed woman, with all the charms of any woman from a big city. How could it be difficult? The third option, and completely unacceptable, was to admit that I was wrong and ask Dave for forgiveness, begging him to take me back. I was confident that I could get Dave back with minimal effort. But the question is, did I really want him back? Of the three options, this would be the easiest for me. I assumed that all I had to do was go home, put on some underwear, give him some sex whenever he wanted for the first week or so, and then everything would go back to normal. I decided to use the third option as a backup plan in case the first two failed. I really liked the first option. So one night after my parents went to bed, I took out my notepad and picked up the newspaper. I started looking at job advertisements and suddenly realized I was in trouble. It was really hard to decide what jobs to apply for when I couldn't even remember what I studied for in college. I needed to talk to Dave. He could remember this useless information. Damn, why do I need to remember this? I was married for over 20 years, and we got married just a few months after I left college. So I called home. The phone rang and rang and no one answered. So I called his cell phone, answered the third call. Dave, honey, what did I study in college? Do I have a degree? I asked. Dave is no longer your dear, and he is busy. A woman's voice answered sharply. Who is this? I asked. Why are you answering my husband's phone? God, Mabel, I know you're a little slow, but don't tell me you don't recognize your own sister's voice, she said. Janet, I snapped. Don't you have anything better to do? David is more than capable of entertaining himself. Goodbye, Mabel, she said. Your major was in childhood development? But that was over 20 years ago. It's probably no longer relevant. And frankly, you'd be a terrible mother and an even worse teacher. Janet hung up on me. Childhood development? Why the hell did I study for this? I thought about it for a while and finally remembered. Before I met Dave and started his business, I wanted to work with children. I was even planning on having children with Dave. He would be a great father. Why did I give up this dream? I thought about it even more and realized it was money. Once Dave's business took off and I started having everything I wanted, it seemed like looking good and being fashionable became even more important. If I got pregnant, it would ruin my figure. I would have become one of those corn-fed country girls with child-bearing hips. The seats in my E-class were simply not big enough for that ass. What about clothes? Most of the designers I wore didn't make clothes that large. So I took the pill. And although Dave had mentioned kids a couple of times over the years, we each had our own activities that kept us busy. Okay, I couldn't find a job. I'll have to do something better and start my own business. Damn, how hard can this be? Dave did it, and if he hadn't been such a good-natured man, we might have become mega rich. All I had to do was figure out what type of business I wanted to start, and then the sky was the limit. So I thought long and hard about what I'm good at and what I enjoy doing. I was so calm while thinking that it made me notice something. My parents were having sex just a few feet away from me in the next room. How dare they? They seemed to be having fun, although they tried to be quiet. Just the thought of my mother spreading her thick legs for my father was enough to shut me up. I began to doubt my sanity. Finally, I could tell they were done. God bless. Then I imagined them lying together in the dark, holding each other, just as Dave and I had done. When did we give up on this? It used to make me feel so good and so loved. I have remembered. This was when I started spending over $300 on my hair. I had to make sure my style was maintained properly, so I had to wear a scarf over it at night, and I couldn't snuggle up with Dave because I needed a special pillow that would support my neck, not my back, head to protect my waves. 
In hindsight, it might not have been such a good deal. Dave always thought I was beautiful, no matter what I wore or how I dressed. Damn, Jeffrey always put down my clothes and appearance if they weren't perfect. Okay, enough about the past. What am I good at? I obviously have a passion for fashion. Maybe I can open my own clothing store and maybe get into design later. This would be a great start. I made a list of everything I need to open my own clothing store. The next morning at breakfast, while my father scowled at me over his cup of coffee, I asked him point blank how much money we had. What does we kemosabe mean? He asked. I'm thinking about starting my own business and I need a lot of money, Dad, I said. He almost fell down laughing at me. Then he straightened up, looked at me, and started laughing again. My mom came in and asked him what was funny. He told her about how I was opening a business. To my mother's credit, she didn't laugh, but smiled, came over and touched my forehead. Seriously, Dad, how much money do we have? I snapped. He became serious and said, No. I was stunned. We've put some money aside for the future, he said. We wanted to be able to do some things and see some things when we were older. We've also saved enough money to give you and your sister some spare change in case of an emergency. But damn it, you can never predict the future. Mom came over and hugged him. Mabel, your mother's health is costing us more than we could ever imagine. When she was first diagnosed and she was literally screaming from ear to ear, I was willing to do whatever I could to stop her pain. Her treatment is expensive, but it is worth it. Looking at her today, you can hardly say that she is experiencing any discomfort. But it has eaten up almost all our savings. I did not know what I would do. I even thought about going back to work so we can have some money. Your husband just received payments and told me not to go back to work so your mom and I can spend our golden years together. He told young people to work. We deserve a rest. So after a few months, when my retirement checks started giving us an almost comfortable bank balance again, I called him and told him we could pay for some of the procedures ourselves. He told us to use the money to take the trips we wanted or go and see the things we wanted to see. So you have some money? I asked. Yes, but I'm doing what my brother-in-law advised. Your mom and I are going to see the Grand Canyon next month, he said. I was angry. How dare he even think about going and seeing some hole in the damn desert when I need the damn money? Dad, I said seriously, isn't it true that if Dave hadn't paid for Mom's treatment, you wouldn't have gone to Damn Canyon in the first place? Probably, he said. You never know what might happen. Well then, since the money came from David and me, it's technically my money and I want it, I said. Mabel, you haven't lifted a finger since you married that man. That's what's wrong with you. He spoiled you to the point where you don't think you should even smell your own farts. Ten cents, Dave gave. So I'll call him and see what he thinks. If he says to give you money, we will do it. I didn't understand what the problem was. As soon as my business takes off, I will pay them back. How long might this take? A couple of weeks, at worst a month, and the money will be returned. Hell, the Grand Canyon was thousands of years old, almost as old as my parents. It wasn't going anywhere. Dad looked at me and went to the phone. He called Dave on his cell phone and soon started talking to him. He laughed and said something, and then told Dave to keep his head up, it would be better, then hung up and came back to me. Dave said that money for your mom's treatment was not dependent on your marriage. It wasn't a gift. It was just family helping each other. He said he will continue to help us whether you stay married or not. He said your mom and I should enjoy the canyon and offered to pay for one of the helicopter tours for us. He said you should go to the bank for a loan to start your business like he did and like everyone else does, my father said, grinning at me. Why didn't I think of that? I cried. For such a boring guy, Dave has some really good ideas. Mabel, there are two more things we need to talk about, my father said. I just looked at him. Yes, Dad. What happened between you and Dave? He seems too upset about it for it to be serious, he asked. I already told you I found someone better, or so I thought, I said. There's one more thing. You should probably start paying us rent to live here, he said. What? I screamed. How can you even think about charging your own daughter rent to sleep on the floor in this? I wisely didn't finish my sentence. 
I just nodded and told him we'd talk about it when I got back from the bank. I borrowed a dress from my mom that didn't look too bad. I went to the bank and filled out an application for a loan. I had to wait over an hour to see the loan manager. He asked me the stupidest questions I've ever heard. Things like, do I have collateral? Do I have business management experience? He wanted to see my business plan and list of expenses. Am I going to rent or buy? Rent or buy what? I had no idea what he was talking about. I got up, apologized, and went home. I was roughly slammed against the wall in my workshop. I thought that maybe someone wanted to steal some tools and equipment. If I had remained silent and not created problems for them, perhaps they would have simply left. I felt the man's hands slide down my sides and reach behind me. They were clearly checking to see if I had a weapon. My heart was beating so fast that I thought it would fly out of my chest. I couldn't remember being so scared for a long time. The attacker reached in front of me and began to unzip my pants. I reached for the light switch on the wall and looked at Janet's smiling face. You scared the crap out of me, I shouted. Well, you won't take care of your end of our deal, she shouted back. Janet was wearing overalls, the kind worn by mechanics and technicians. She pulled her long hair into a ponytail and wore a backwards baseball cap. She was also wearing safety glasses, but the zipper of the jumpsuit stopped at her waist, and I could see two bare breasts threatening to burst out at any moment. What do you mean I don't care about my goal? I asked. Last night you slept in bed with a healthy naked woman who clearly wanted to cuddle with you. And you didn't do a damn thing, she said. You said we don't have to do anything? I said, reminding her. Well, I lied, she said. Did you enjoy sleeping in my bed last night? I nodded my head. I really did. It was like when Mabel and I were younger, only better. There is nothing better than snuggling with a warm body while you sleep, especially when that body moves and takes the shape of yours. You feel so... loved. I think most people miss this more than sex when a marriage ends. Over the past few years, since Mabel became too fashionable for me, I've missed it. Say something stupid, Janet said. Yes, I liked it, I said. I really felt special and just looked after. The word you're trying to avoid is love, she snapped. I felt the same way. The problem is that at night when you run your hands all over my body, it causes a reaction. I, as you can see, she said, turning around and spanking herself. Very, she turned to face me. Healthy young woman, she squeezed her breasts as if she wanted me to come and inspect them. So if you're going to keep sleeping with me, it's not free. It will cost you money, she said. I'll write you a check, I muttered. No nonsense, no money, she said. I want some of this. She rubbed the front of my pants and then stepped back and smiled. Forget it, she said. Anyway, you're almost ready to burst. It probably won't be a problem. She took my hand and we walked over to the computer. She scanned several photos of my car. We looked at the car from different angles and changed parts in it. We changed the wheels and tires. We have changed the front grills. We have added a dark back panel. We completely replaced the brake system. We changed the color. Then we started arguing. The argument started when she asked me if I wanted to install a supercharger or try something unusual like a turbocharger. American muscle cars rarely use turbos. Even nitrous oxide injection systems were more common. In the end, we just decided to do the engine modifications as an afterthought. We found that we work well together. We both fell in love with the chrome Hilo T's wheels at the same time. Janet wanted 20-inch wheels. I reminded her that these wheels were not lightweight, so the extra two inches in diameter would slow the car down. We ordered wheels with Hankook racing tires. We then found and ordered drilled and slotted brake rotors and pure white brake calipers to match the paint color we chose. We ordered chrome top and bottom grills and got on with the job. Then we approached the car and began to disassemble it. After removing the wheels, we realized that we would also have to redo the suspension. We spent a total of four hours in the car, and then Janet suggested we stop. We returned to her house, and she suggested that I change clothes. The funny thing was that even though we were both supposed to sleep in her room, she put all or almost all of my things in the closet in the guest room. 
It seems that women can share anything with a man except their closet. We showered together, of course, to wash off the oil and dirt from the car, and then Janet headed to her room. I quickly changed into casual pants and a shirt. I was sitting on the bed in the room, testing its springiness, when Janet entered. I was fascinated. First of all, she changed her clothes in just a few minutes. Mabel usually spent two hours getting ready to go to the store, and secondly, as good as she looked, Janet was beautiful. I always knew she was beautiful, but perhaps because she was 15 years younger than Mabel, I always perceived her as a child. But at almost 30, she became a real woman. She had beautiful round buttocks that fit perfectly in jeans. It wasn't a model's butt, barely noticeable. That was real country girl ass. Her waist was terribly thin and then widened out again to match her attractive breasts. They seemed to have a life of their own as they bounced and moved under her shirt. Even under the control of the bra, there was enough movement to realize that they were real. Where are we going? I asked her. To the cinema, she said. Don't worry, we won't go to the drive-in movie theater. But we need to get you out in front of people so people can see that this thing with my stupid sister didn't break you. And off we went. We went to see the new film with Nicolas Cage. Janet adored Nicolas Cage. As we left the theater, we walked down the street, and I couldn't help but hold her hand as we discussed what we liked and didn't like about the movie. It was another one of those qualities about her. I simply never lacked things to talk about with Janet. Mabel and I rarely spoke. I always start conversations about business or events in the city. She wasn't interested. She would talk about new clothes or vacation spots, and I really wasn't interested in those things. So I guess we just stopped talking after a while. We had dinner at a diner and laughed the whole time. Then we went home to sit on the porch and talk some more. Janet could be so open about many topics, but at the same time, there were things that she simply refused to take seriously, like when I thanked her for spending so much time with me and helping me get through what Mabel did to me, she just rolled her eyes and said, Men. She was also very unpredictable. While we were having dinner at the restaurant, a couple of people came up to us to express their regret about what happened between Mabel and me. I was surprised how much people in town cared. Anyway, when the conversation turned to a couple of people about how Janet and I got along, Janet became very nervous. Well, I have to help him feel better. We're family, Janet said. He's not ready to date yet, Sally, so don't rush to take off your big undies too soon. The next morning, when we returned home from our morning run, Millie Tyler was waiting for us on Janet's porch. Good morning, Janet, she said sharply, and then, slowly, like maple syrup dripping down the side of a tree in early autumn, she said, Good morning, Dave. Janet went on the offensive. Millie Tyler, it's too early in the morning for decent people to come visit. Besides, we don't have time for visitors. Dave needs to do his morning exercises. He looks perfectly healthy, Millie said, smiling at me. I just came to tell him that I'm really sorry for how that damn Mabel treated him, and I wanted to invite him over for dinner and help him through his time of grief. She looked at me, and for the first time I noticed the size of Millie's breasts and the fact that she was obviously not wearing a bra. Dave, you need to be careful when choosing the person to help you get over Mabel. I'm sure you don't want to be in the same situation in, say, 15 years. She was so unobtrusive that I didn't immediately understand her hint, but Janet did, and it started. Janet went from the sweet and caring woman I had always known to something completely different this morning. Millie, get your ass off my porch and never come to my house again. If Dave decides to come back to the house he shares with Mabel, you can visit him there, or he can come to you if he wants. But never again. Don't come here if you know it's good for you. Well, I baked him this fresh strawberry pie. Millie smiled, handing me a plate of pie. Janet quickly snatched the pie before I could accept it and threw it halfway down the driveway. He's on a diet, he doesn't need your damn cake, and he's allergic to strawberries, she snapped. Now get lost. Then she stared at me and grabbed my hand, dragging me into the house. Janet held my knees as I did crunches, but there was no kissing, and when I did push-ups, I had to do them alone while she just counted. I wanted so badly to get to 20 to see what I would get. 
but even though my arms hurt, I only made it to 14. You don't care anymore about me becoming a better person? I asked. Do you want more time to stare at Millie's huge breasts? Janet barked. Of course not. These things are too big. She'll probably strangle me in my sleep, I said. So what size do you like? She asked. Well, Millie's are obviously too big, I said. And to be honest, Mabel's were too small. So someone in the middle would be perfect. This made Janet smile again. Over the next few weeks, we were together almost all the time. We got up together and kind of played sports together. We went to work together, had lunch together. We worked on my car together, ate dinner together, and every night we talked and watched the evening sky together. During this month, I lost almost nine kilograms. I looked much younger and in better shape than I had in a long time. In the fifth week, Janet suddenly suggested that I go into town and get my hair cut. She knew exactly what she wanted and told the hairdresser. Then we bought me a couple of new suits and a couple of dresses for Janet. She said we should go out, maybe even to a nearby town, to celebrate my weight loss and the new me. We still had to wait for a couple of things to get it done. We were almost done with the car, but were still waiting on some parts. We decided to compromise. Janet still wanted a boost, but I didn't like most power boosters because over time they tend to wear out your rotating assembly. However, Janet showed me an ad online for a hood intake system. This was a large pipe that was mounted on top of the engine and fed more air into the intake. Theoretically, the faster you go, the more extra air it will pump in. The same theory as a supercharger or turbocharger, but without forced air. It was due to arrive in a few days and we would install it and then spend our evening on the way out. But a lot changed that evening and the next morning. First of all, Janet and I often satisfied each other sexually, but that night we just lay in bed as usual. We were clinging to each other, and we always said it was just for warmth or to feel cared for, but suddenly she turned around, climbed on top of me. We made love quite vigorously at first, and then we just slowed down. Don't get me wrong, we were both healthy people, and we had sex several times a month, not as often as she'd hinted she'd like, and certainly not as often as I would like, but this time was just different. Instead of her screaming, take me or something like that, she said things that were much more personal. It seemed like they shouldn't be discussed. I remember her saying, make me yours, Dave. And in the depths of my soul, I then realized that I wanted her to become mine. She simply whispered those three words that ruined our wonderful casual relationship. Love you, Dave. Then she suddenly stood up and left the bed. It was as if I saw something I shouldn't have seen. When I woke up the next morning, Janet was different. I tried to hug her, as I had done so many times over the past five weeks, but she pulled away from me. Dave, I'm not feeling well this morning. I don't want to infect you if I have something, she said. Can you go for a run without me? Yes, but I can't have breakfast without you, I told her. Dave, I don't think I can eat today. If I do, I'm not sure it will stay with me she replied. What about our big dinner and a night on the town? I asked. Maybe we should postpone it? No, darling, I wouldn't miss this for the world, she smiled. See you later. Being as unperceptive as I am, I didn't notice anything from that day. She did show up at work later and watched me work on the car. When we finished, she ran up and hugged me. This hug was the best part, even better than the car. Later that night at dinner, everything was perfect. Janet looked more beautiful than ever. The car was great. The food was great. I should have expected a few dark clouds. Dave, I think you're ready to stand on your own two feet again, she said just after dinner. At least all the damage my idiot sister did to you has been repaired. Janet, what are you talking about? I asked. Nothing. I just think you're ready to go back to your own home and get on with your life she said. People are starting to talk about us. But actually, Mabel will be in court next week as a witness in Jeff's divorce, she said. This will give you two a chance to talk about your own. What are you talking about? I asked. Is this related to last night? Don't worry about it, she said. I could tell she was trying to be emotionless. You were just too good in bed, and I started acting stupid. You know you and I are just two healthy people getting their needs met. 
It's always been about so that you're strong enough to make a choice. You're in better shape now, and you look a lot better, but you're still the same wonderful person my stupid sister married. I'm sure I saw a tear roll down her cheek. Go to court and look at her, she said. Then think about what you really want. If you decide you want her back, you can do it. But make sure she's the one who changes. There's nothing wrong with you. That night, we still slept together, but all we did was sleep. The next morning, Janet left for Chicago to spend time with her parents. I hate my parents. Over the last week, we've been running around turning the media room into a bedroom. Looks like we'll have a special guest who needs his own room. I'm sleeping on the living room floor like a damn puppy, and their special guest will have the room. I've even stopped trying to move to the couch in the middle of the night because if my dad catches me on the couch during his nightly trips to the bathroom, he gets mad. I gave up the idea of starting my own business and decided to choose the second option, find another man. I've only been on three dates in the last seven weeks. None of them were promising except one. The first two guys were terrible. Guy number one was a stockbroker and he was rich enough that he took me to a very exclusive French restaurant. We sat in a booth in the far corner. I asked for a table closer to the entrance or in the center, but when the head waiter asked where he wanted to sit, my witness pointed to the dark corners in the back. It's more romantic there, my witness told me. Dinner was great, and then he took me to his home. As soon as we entered, he went to his palace for the night. He took out a bottle of wine and then told me to take off my clothes. What? I asked. Take off your clothes? He said. Um... I don't do anything sexual until at least the third or fourth date, I said in shock. He seemed so sophisticated. Listen, Maysu, he said. Mabel, I corrected him. Whatever, he said. I called you tonight because the woman I'm really interested in is busy with something. The only future for us is a friends with benefits relationship. I'm not interested in being your friend without benefits. So if you want to wait until your third or fourth date, you're crazy. There won't even be a second date. Now take off your clothes. Take me home now, I said. You're a big girl, he said. Get out. He then held the door open for me. Can you at least call me a taxi? I asked. Okay, he said. You're a taxi. Honestly, I meant another C word, but if you want to be a taxi... Next thing I know, he closed the door and I had no idea where I was. Fortunately, I knew my parents' address. I started walking towards the main road. I saw some shops and restaurants there that I could call from. Unfortunately, before I got there, it started to rain, lightly at first. But by the time I reached the main road, it was pouring like buckets. I walked into the store looking like a drowned rat to call a taxi. My second date was more memorable. I met a guy on the internet. It was one of those findyourpartner.com sites. He was exactly what I was looking for, a rich, distinguished gentleman who loved the finer things in life and was generous, exactly what I hoped Dave would become. At 7.30 p.m., the limousine stopped in front of my parents' house. I went out and sat in it. There, in the back seat, was the oldest man I had ever seen. He was older than my grandparents when they died. He even had an oxygen tank built into the limousine. The first thing he told me, between ragged breaths, was that I was older than I told him. He also said that I was a little overweight. Before we could leave the block, he tried to squeeze one of my breasts with his bony hand. Um, she's kind of soft, he said with a frown. Then his eyes rolled back and all sorts of alarms began to sound. The driver stopped the car and got into the back seat, began injecting him and beating him on the chest. While he was working on the old man, he looked at me and told me to get out of the car. We were about five miles from my parents' house. As I started walking, I noticed a store where I could probably call my dad. I headed towards the store. Two guys jumped out of the alley and dragged me into it. One of them grabbed my bag and started going through it. All you have is three damn dollars? He exclaimed. Where is the rest? That's all I have, I shrugged. I'm going through a divorce. Well, look at you, he exclaimed. Okay, take off your clothes. We don't have all night. There's no way I'm going to get naked in an alley so you can have sex with me, I screamed. His partner came up and hit me hard in the face. As my head began to spin, he laughed at me as he very gently removed my skirt. Then he took off my top almost lovingly. 
I stood in an alley in just my bra and panties in front of two men whose faces I couldn't see because of the masks they were wearing. I couldn't believe how excited I was. But it's been a few months since I've had sex. Two guys grabbed my clothes and started to retreat. Hey, aren't you going to do this? I asked. Hell no, said the first guy. Besides, said the second guy, your breasts look kind of soft. We can sell your clothes at that store down the street and get enough money for an available girl. Then they left me standing there, naked. What else could go wrong? I thought about it, and then I felt the familiar dampness in my hair as I heard the sound of a bird overhead. Damn, I thought, and I was right. My third date was the worst. Almost as soon as we got into his car, he started pestering me. He tried to secretly touch my breasts. He tried to touch my legs while he was driving. Where are we? I asked. Where are we going? We are here, he said. But it's a parking lot, I said. They don't take you to the parking lot on a date. Darling, he said, this is not a date. Eh? I said. I was confused. What do you mean this isn't a date? I asked him. Listen, little sister, he said. You've already been on a few bad dates, right? Um, yeah, I said. How many bad dates have you been on? A few, right? He asked. More than a few, I said. I thought about all the terrible dates I'd been on before I met Dave. Then I started thinking about Jeff and all the guys I met after I married Dave. Suddenly I realized what a fool I had been. Dave adored me like I was special. As I got older, Dave changed. He loved me more. As my butt got bigger, Dave started liking women with big butts. Every other man I went out with thought I was just another piece of meat. Even that lying bastard Jeff who started it all. Well, continued my witness, when a girl goes on a bad date, she wastes time. When a guy goes on a bad date, he wastes both money and time, and more often than not, it takes several dates to even figure out whether sex will happen. And even then, it's at least one or twice before you know if she's any good at it. Yes, that's true, I said. It's harder for men. That's why I started doing auditions before meeting anyone, he said. This is not a date. This is your audition. Don't get me wrong. I like you, but I can't change the rules, he said. What should I do at the audition, I asked. Should I tell you about myself and my preferences? Um, no, honey. Save the romantic nonsense for the date. You could start by getting naked and lying in the back seat, he smiled. You expect me to have sex with you to get a date? I screamed. He simply nodded. So what if I decide not to do this? I grinned mockingly. He just shrugged as if he didn't care. You've got a long way to go home, honey. You better get started, he said. I stuck one leg out of the car and looked up. Several angry pigeons were circling the area, and it looked like it was going to rain. Okay, I said. Whatever he did to me had to be better than being pissed on by birds and soaked in the rain. Less than five minutes later, we were having sex in the back seat of his car. I looked up at the upholstery of his car, trying to figure out how I was going to get Dave back. Dating clearly wasn't working. We had sex twice before he took me home. I think that's when I realized that Dave really was special. He seemed to be the only man who knew how to make love. Every other man I've slept with was only out for his own pleasure. They all used me. Dave really loved me and I really messed it up. As soon as my witness stopped at my parents' house, I got out of the car as quickly as possible. Um, baby, thanks for listening, he said. But I'm not sure I want to date you. You're like a piece of wood in bed. I was ready to explode with laughter until I noticed my mom, dad, and sister standing on the porch with their mouths wide open in surprise. You're an easy girl, exclaimed Janet. She returned to the house. Mom and dad followed her, leaving me alone. Mabel, what the hell is wrong with you? asked my dad. Why does Janet have her own room? I asked. Janet is not married, my dad answered sharply. She doesn't have a husband to go back to and she's going through an emotional period right now. Dad, next week, if I don't play my cards right, I won't have a husband to go back to either, I cried. Janet and Mom then entered the room. 
Mabel cheated on Dave, sharply Janet snapped. She got caught and the whole town knew what was going on, so we all came together to help. How was she caught? asked my father. You know how they go from car to car in the driveway and show people on the big screen. My father laughed at this. It's really funny when they catch someone eating or with mustard on their face, he laughed. Well, they caught your daughter with a guy squeezing her breasts while she pleasured him, Janet snapped. Almost everyone in the city saw it. They got together and asked her to sign the one that the judge issued. What is OND? Mom asked. An overnight scam, Janet said. In our state, a divorce takes a minimum of 60 days. In 10 days, Mabel and Dave will sign the final papers and divorce. They will have a meeting to decide if they want to change the terms of the divorce, which Mabel signed. She signed it under duress. I think they would have tarred and feathered her if she hadn't done that. But once she signed that document, essentially both she and Dave could do or not do what they wanted, with whomever they wanted. So she may be an approachable girl, but it's legit. And it will be even more so next week when she signs the final documents. I'm not signing a damn thing, I snapped. Over the last couple of months, I realized what I had and I want this idiot back. You know I can wrap it around my little finger like this. When I leave for court tomorrow, I'm going to spend the entire week between Jeff's divorce and mine trying to get my husband back so this nightmare can end. Why are you here, Janet? And don't try to stop me from getting him back. I asked. I don't want him to make decisions about how to run his life because of what I want, she said. Dave is like that. He is probably the nicest person I know. I want him to understand what he wants and what will make him happy. I don't want to see him do anything because he's trapped in it no matter what. This. Then she went to her room. Two days later, I got off the bus and took a taxi to my home. Surprisingly, the locks on the doors were not changed. My keys were even on the table in the hallway. This was a good sign. Dave didn't change the locks because he wanted me to be here. I went upstairs and took a good shower for the first time in a long time. I looked through my closet of nice clothes to choose an outfit. I posted a beautiful dress and an almost hidden sheer bra and panty set. The panties must have shrunk during the wash. I had a hard time getting them on my butt. When I did this, they became so tight that they left wrinkles on my legs, and the elastic at the waist broke. Of course, the bra will still fit. I couldn't put on the dress either. I had to choose a different outfit. It was also a tight fit, of course, but at least I got it on. I was supposed to appear in court at 10, and it was 9 in the morning, so I had to go. I sank into the plush seats of your car. Damn it, I miss it it. I drove into the city and had just entered the city square when a white Mustang flew past me. It was a good car. Maybe I could get my stuck-in-the-mud husband to trade in his rusty old Mustang for one of these. The car parked a few places away from me. It was good to see new people moving into town. When the guy got out of the car, my jaw dropped. It was Dave, my husband. Dave. He lost about 13 kilograms and cut his hair. He was more handsome than ever. He disappeared while I was staring at him. I couldn't wait for him to come home in the evening. Maybe I'll even visit him at work. I haven't been there in years, so it was time to visit. Suddenly getting him back wasn't just something I had to do to survive, but something I actually wanted to do. I sat and watched from the back of the courtroom as a man's honor was destroyed. I could have been there if it weren't for my friends, I thought. Without the judge, the sheriff, and so many other people, especially Janet, I would be in the same condition as this poor guy. His wife was dominant and seemed to enjoy everything that happened to him. Was Mabel better? Sure. In our marriage, I controlled the money. But Mabel controlled me. So what's the difference? Although I wanted to see Jeffrey humiliated, it was too much. Mabel stepped up to the podium and told her piece. This told me a little more about what was going on between her and Jeffrey or at least as much as she was willing to admit, in court. The case left poor Jeff with nothing but the clothes on his back and my sympathy. As his wife and her powerful team of lawyers left, she looked at me and nodded her head. Looks like it's your turn now, she said. Teach that bitch a lesson. I turned to leave, and as I was leaving the courtroom, Mabel ran up to me. Dave, honey, 
I'm so sorry about all this, she said. I think my hormones were out of whack. I don't know what made me do that. I think something was wrong, Mabel. You look, uh, different, I said, and then started to walk away. Wait, Dave, are you going home? Do you want to talk? Maybe we could have dinner together, she asked. I don't think so, Mabel, I said. See you in court. I smiled and whistled as I walked away from her. I finally knew what I wanted, and what should I do? Eight days later, Janet returned home. Millie was the first person she met when she pulled into the store parking lot. Hi, Millie, she said. Sorry about that thing a few weeks ago. Don't worry about it, Millie said. We were both chasing the same guy. It happens. Have you heard the news about your sister? Asked Millie. Janet shook her head. She and her husband decided to sell that huge house and move away. They drove around in that fancy car for a week, giving orders and buying things. They can't wait to get out of here. I guess it shows they can make some money, said Millie. After everything he's been through, the divorce and everything, you'd think he'd have a little more backbone. Well, once you get it, you always get it, I guess. Janet's heart and stomach sank. She really believed, or hoped, that Dave would be stronger. But she would have to continue living her life. She had no other choice. She drove up to her house and saw a white Mustang in her driveway. Dave was always generous. Perhaps he left her the car as a token of their time together. If only he knew how much this time meant to her. When she accidentally revealed her true feelings, she knew she had to leave him. Then the next morning, while talking about time, she discovered another reason to let him go. She tried to open the door and was having difficulty doing so. When suddenly the door was suddenly open ed and she found herself in an embrace, being squeezed mercilessly. Welcome home, Dave said. What are you doing here? She asked sharply. Shouldn't you be with my idiot sister? Why should I be with her, Janet? I love you, he said. We're divorced. I gave her the house and some money and told her to sell the house and get more money and leave. If she doesn't sell the house within six months, she'll only get 50000 and will tear down the building and turn it into a sports complex for children from both cities. Where will you live? she asked. With you, he said. I hope so, but I can sleep in the guest room if you want. Oh, no, buddy. We've already talked about this, she said, throwing her arms around him. Then she pulled him towards the swing on the veranda. Dave, the guest room will be gone soon, she smiled. Have you finally decided to enter the 21st century and turn it into a media room like your parents? He asked. Um, no, honey, she said. It will eventually become a bedroom, but it will be something else for a couple of years. So I'll end up getting my own room? He said. Oh, God, you fool, she exclaimed. You got me pregnant. This is supposed to be a nursery for a while, and then we'll turn it into a bedroom for our baby. Also, I love you too. Well, I'm glad I didn't give all our money to your sister, he said. Why? She smiled. We'll be fine. Yes, but next time you get pregnant, we'll have to add another room to the house, he said. Who's Mabel's new man? Janet asked. Jeffrey, Dave chuckled. I met with them the day Mabel and I signed our final divorce papers. I offered them a million dollars and a house to split. Since Janet was only going to receive a few thousand dollars in a very short period, and Jeffrey was essentially homeless and without money, they agreed. But I added a few conditions. Which? Janet smiled, kissing him and clinging to him. Well, even though they hate each other now, they only get paid as long as they stay together. If either of them leaves the other or cheats, they lose all rights. The funny thing is that Mabel has gained at least 22 kilos, and Jeffrey is no longer interested in her, if he ever was. He blames her for ruining his marriage and career. And she saw how spineless and pathetic he is, and she blames him for the failure of our marriage, so she hates him with a passion. However, there are only two things they hate more than each other. What two things? Janet asked. To work and have no money, Dave said, grinning. They'll kill each other, Janet said, stretching her long legs over his and placing his hands on her barely rounded belly. Don't get too cozy just yet, I told her. We still have things to do. 
Such as? She asked. Well, I said. When this all started, I was a happily married man. Now I'm happy again, but not married. Janet looked at me with tears in her eyes. You mean, she said, you want that I... Yes, I said. I need Millie's phone number. Janet threw me onto the floor of the veranda and looked at me with an evil glint in her eyes. I felt the area near my thigh. Oh, damn, Janet, you broke it, I said. Sorry, honey, she said. Is it a leg or a hip? I'm not that old. I snapped. You broke the box with your wedding ring. She rolled me over and started searching my pocket until something else came up. I could tell she noticed. She found the box and put it aside as she took off my pants right there on her veranda. Would you like to look at the ring first? I asked. Don't get me wrong, she said. The ring is important, but it's not like I'm going to say no. I've wanted this most of my life. But as important as the ring is, that's more important. She then picked up the box and ring and headed to her car. Janet, where are you going? I asked, puzzled. I have to show my ring to Millie and those bitches in town so they'll leave you alone. She grinned. Janet and I got married, had four children, and lived happily ever after. Less than a year after our wedding, about three months after the birth of our eldest daughter, Mabel showed up in town. She and Jeff went through all the money and broke up. Jeffrey ended up in jail for bad checks. He and his cellmate Bubba are said to be quite happy together. Mabel needed a job. We had a problem because she didn't have the skills. But family has to help the family. And since she was Janet's sister, we hired her as a delivery driver for minimum wage. She lives in a small apartment we built above the garage. Sometimes we pay her more to watch the kids while Janet and I go out and have fun. We decided that the child development degree should be used for something. Sometimes Janet and I catch her longing glance and we just smile and wave. I know there are those who think she got off too easily after everything she put me through, and you may be right. But on the other hand, they say that the best revenge is a life well lived. I'm extremely happy. I love Janet and our children and my life much more than I ever loved Mabel. Janet is thrilled that she finally got me. And Mabel must look at us every day and think about what she lost and what could have been. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.